Sugar Free Jolly Ranchers. That's awesome. Okay. <laughs> Let's go ahead and pray. Okay. Father, thank you so much for this group of ladies. Thank you for the opportunity to gather in the name of Jesus Christ tonight and over this weekend. Lord, we know that you want to teach us. You want to knit hearts together in love. Uh, you want to correct us. You want to comfort us. You want to lead us into things that uh, we never knew before. And you want to dismantle ideas we have about you or ourselves or others. It's just not built right. We don't even know it's not built right until your word comes and says, no, you're off, you're wrong. And, and you, you kind of come in like those home improvement shows and, you know, they pick up a big old mallet and just knock the whole wall down. Father, it's exciting because we know anytime you tear something apart, you have the full intention of rebuilding. If anybody here feels broken, shattered, their life is in ruins, I pray that you would remind them that you, you've only allowed that because you're going to build something better. And Lord, we know that even refurbished wood from barns makes the most beautiful tables. You take old weathered wood and, and if man can do that, how much more can you? I ask for your Holy Spirit to lead and guide us to the truth tonight. Pray that we might forget what church we were at, <clears throat> who was the speaker, but we remember your truth. And that, Lord, anybody here who has that kind of social anxiety or you know, this is unusual for them to do, they're not used to this dynamic, Lord, would you just commend them for going beyond their comfort zone and saying, my relationship with Jesus Christ is worth being uncomfortable? Lord, I, I just admire people that have a hard time in social settings. And they break through and they say, if Jesus went to the cross, that was pretty uncomfortable. I can definitely pick up my cross. I don't like to be around groups. I don't want to share a room with ladies I don't know. But they, they go forward because they're no longer living for themselves. But they're living for the one who loved them and gave himself for them. Encourage them greatly, Lord. And let them know how pleased you are with their decisions to come. In Jesus' name. Amen. We're on Friday night, so open your Bibles, please, to John 15. John 15. Looking around. Where's Marta? Where's April? Where are you? Oh, there they are. Okay. I have some my friends here. I'm going to have books available, but they're not set up because I didn't get early enough to do that. So there'll be some books if you're interested in any. You can look at um, later tonight or tomorrow. Um, but Bible study guides. You can listen to studies and do them. You can even host a Bible study in your house and listen, you know, and then do all the questions. And there's a devotional book and there's a book for people going through cancer and things like that. So um, I just want to say that because sometimes I forget to tell people that and they leave and then they go, you didn't tell us. So that's why I'm telling you. I don't want to hear that. John 15, verse 1. Jesus is teaching here and he says, I am the true vine. My father is the vine dresser, the gardener, the one who takes care of the vineyard. Verse 2 of John 15, every branch in me that doesn't bear fruit, the vine dresser takes it away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, so it may bear more fruit. Verse 3, you are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, unless it abides in the vine, neither can you, unless you abide in me. So in this section of scripture, Jesus is talking to his disciples. He's telling them this uh, picture of his relationship with them being connected right before he is going to die. This is something he's telling them he's gonna, he's gonna die. He's giving them some pretty poignant and weighty truths he wants them to have before he leaves. If you ever read the gospels and you get near the end when he's going to die, those are the things that sort of just slow down and really take in what he is saying in those few chapters before he dies. Because we know that when someone's going to die, they tend to, you know, not, you know, talk about things that don't matter. They're kind of in context. They see things more clearly. The closer you get to the finish line, the more you understand the race. 
And so all throughout John 15, 16, 17, stay in it for a year if you want to, because it's, it's weighty, it's weighty, weighty words. I know, uh, given the, ch the prognosis in June, that they said I had a year to live in June, um, things kind of changed a little bit. My, um, my balance went in a little bit of a different direction. And I don't mean in fear or anything like that. But I definitely went in, in the angle of, uh, you know, kind of, I already thought I knew what really mattered, having already been fighting cancer. I went to a whole other level of what really matters. I didn't know I could go to another level. I'm sure once I enter hospice, I'll be at a whole nother level, hoping it'll be sweet and deeper and wonderful. But it, it, it started to remind me of things that I really wanted to make sure I got across. And I actually sat down with my adult children recently and I said, listen to me. You need to listen to me. When I say anything to you from this point on, I don't want to hear, I know. I don't want to hear, I already heard that. I don't want to hear, I disagree. I want you to just listen to me. And after I leave, you can throw certain things away because a lot of our moms and dads tell us things that we go, that really didn't work for my life, but it's what they wanted to impart to us. I said, I need you to cooperate with instruction. I need you to, to just listen. And especially as telling my youngest daughter, I said, because I'm like my mother, um, overly emphasized education in my household, uh, more than practical life, responsibilities. My mother did the same thing to me. I never had chores, never had to clean the house. I had to get A's. That's, that's all I knew. I had to do well and go to college and be successful. And so that, you know, then you move out and you find out you have to do the dishes because nobody <laughs> does them. And the, the grades are really not preparing dinner for you. So um, I, I told my daughter, I said, I've kind of done you a disservice because, you know, I, I would offer her, would you like to learn to make this? No, mom, I'm busy. And I would let her do that. I told her, I said, from now on, I need you to do things because there's things that I don't know how to make that my mother made and I kicked myself for not having learned them. So I don't want to, you know, I don't want you at the funeral looking at me and saying, you never taught me how to make pork chops and gravy. You know, that would just be a really sad thing at the funeral. So I want her to be able to have the food that I've taught her. But I'm lining this in because I can see that Jesus is saying things because he knows he's departing. He's leaving them. So this isn't just teaching next to the Sea of Galilee, so I'll three more years with them. I'll get that other stuff in later. This is the later, and this truth about the vine branch relationship is absolutely necessary for them to understand. Later, in John 14, 28, uh, he says to them, you have heard me say to you, I am going away. He says, I'm going to the Father. He's trying to let them know I, you know, pay attention. I'm not going to be next to you anymore to speak this to you as a friend next to you. John 14, 30, he said, I will no longer talk much with you. So when we're going over these truths this weekend, I know there's a million retreat themes. I love most of them. Um, but this one, I want you to just realize it's, it's, it's the advice, counsel, and instruction of a man who's facing execution. And he's saying the things that really matter. And we need to really take it seriously. I mean, I know the fruit thing's cute and blinking lights and stuff. But we gotta go beyond the cuteness and really see the poignant truths that God, that Jesus is explaining and the decor is kind of um, reminding us of, if you will. In the next chapter, Jesus explains one of the reasons he speaks these truths in John 15, one to four. In John 16, one, he says, this is after he gives John 15, one to four, because we're looking at John 15, one to four today. In John 16, one, he says, these things I have spoken to you, that you should not be made to stumble. So he's saying, I'm giving you something that's gonna help you not trip up. And you're, you're gonna be weak need, and you're gonna be a little shaken, because they're not even grasping the fact that he's about ready to die. He isn't, uh, you know, walking around with a cane or a chemotherapy. They, they, they know how glorious he is. I think in the back of their mind, this is going to go on forever. Hey, maybe we'll overcome the Romans. Um, it, it, I think nowhere in their mind did they think that short, that short of time with Jesus in his ministry. I just know they didn't. And so they weren't as attentive. We know that because 
when you get to the Garden of Gethsemane and they're all sleeping, there's no way that they really understood what was about to happen and how the landscape of their lives were going to change. And Jesus was no longer going to be that which we had handled, that which we have heard, that which we saw with our own eyes. It wasn't going to happen anymore. The word stumble there means to put a stumbling block or impediment in the way upon which another may trip and fall to be a stumbling block. He's saying, look, I'm giving you these things so that you won't be stumbled by things. I'm going to give you this truth and, and teach you about stumbling so you don't stumble. I'm going to warn you ahead of time so you don't do this. I know um, the other day someone accidentally knocked over uh, my laundry detergent in the garage. And of course, it's supposed to seal, but it didn't, right? I walked by the garage and went, man, my garage has never smelled so good. But who cleaned the garage? It smells like laundry detergent. <laughs> well, there's laundry detergent. It was poured out all over. And um, I didn't see it. I smelled it earlier. And my husband came in and goes, Marty, Marty, I'm going to wake you up. Like, what? He goes, I just have to warn you about the laundry detergent. He was looking like, it's 10 o'clock at night. What is my husband warning me about laundry detergent? I said, what, honey? He goes, well, somebody spilled it, and it's all over the dryer. It's all over the floor. If you walk in there, you, you know, you could just slide, right? And I'm, I don't need that. You know, there's a whole other thing going on. So he's telling me about it so I won't stumble. So something that's going to be in my path won't take me down. And Jesus is knowing that his disciples are going to face some pretty intense things in their paths coming up after Jesus dies and after he rises again. And he's telling them these things. He doesn't want them to stumble over things that most likely you would stumble over if you weren't warned about ahead of time. He wanted their journey to be free of hazards. He wanted his people to have the smoothest path possible. And you know, the Bible says, I do not have the reference. You know, it says, make plain paths for my feet. I pray that a lot. Because I, you know, do you ever like, I can't see it. I don't know what choice to make. You know, like, or you're like, this is getting too hard. But you know, make, make your path straight before my face. Um, let me see what's a hindrance and not be overwhelmed by it. Recently, I had this vision. I was praying about something in my life. I go, Lord, I, this is a hard one. I don't know how to get over this one. And the Lord gave me a vision of, of someone I know. And um, they're a person that um, caused some problems in somebody else's life. Not mine. And I had a vision, and this person was laying across the path. They're very tall. And I'm walking on the path. And I can't go on the path because, you know, they're tall and they're in the way. And the Lord goes, I'm looking at how tall a person is. I'm noticing their path. He goes, walk over them. <laughs> like, why are you analyzing the obstacle? You know, it doesn't matter how tall a person is if they're laying flat on the floor. You know, I, mean, I was actually evaluating how high they were. He's going, they're flat. They're on the ground. Yes, you're going to have to take a step to get over them, but walk over that hindrance. And that's what the Lord was doing to these disciples. He's kind of saying, you're going to, I'm going to die and you're going to be faced with weird stuff. And I'm telling you these things so you can walk, just walk on over them. Don't interrupt your flow. Let's not be babies, okay? We can never have flows interrupted, okay? Soldiers of the Lord. You know, oh, this isn't the way I planned it. Well, welcome to the army of the Lord. It's not going to be the way you planned it. But it doesn't mean that you don't have to adapt when things change. But the adaptation is often not as difficult as we brace ourselves for it to be. <laughs> the enemy intimidates us more with our analysis than usually the actual hindrance that's there. We, we build these things huge, you know, we, we make them huge and all that kind of stuff. And the enemy's laughing because it's, it's just a big Macy's Parade balloon, you know, it's moving a little over, but you know, you just get one needle, pff, it's gone, keep going on your way. So he's saying, I've written these things to you so that you will not stumble. I've told you these things. So as we look here at John 15, these teachings that Jesus was giving his disciples about the vine branch relationship, I need us to realize that these teachings are, 
are what are going to keep us from avoiding unnecessary impediments, trip hazards, stumbling, depression, lifelessness, confusion of who we are. Because when he leaves, they don't know who they are. The disciples do not. They're caught off guard. If you ever had that happen at work, they go, oh, yeah, we fired so-and-so. So-and-so's your new manager. You're like, you know, I don't know what kind of coffee to bring them. Like you're all throwing off because things change. Your, your church gets a new pastor. You move locations. You just move houses. Have you ever moved houses or apartments? And you don't remember where the forks are, storage you put them in? You keep grabbing sponges for your cereal and you realize, ah, that's, it's disorienting, isn't it? If we focus on what we're going to learn, we're not going to be as disoriented when things change. We're not going to stumble over them. They're still going to be there, but it's equipping us on how to continue in our identities and in our callings and in our relationship with him by being branches and vines together. These truths are meant to give us consistency, to cause us to make progress. You ever got stuck before in your walk with the Lord? Vine branch, big thing. Vine branch connection keeps you from growing stagnant, um, growing brittle, getting um, confused, just uh, kind of blowing around in the wind. If you can get back to what we're going to learn this weekend, to, especially tonight, that abiding in him, you're really going to find a sense of security and consistency in a world that is absolutely chaotic and unpredictable. <laughs> and I don't know about you, but I need it. Our paths will be cleared of certain things that could slow us down, cause us to be unnecessarily impeded in our progress. So I want us, based on these things that Jesus said in John 16, and what he says before that, we ha and he's dying, we need to highly value the instructions this weekend. Amen. <laughs> Good timing. And out of all these verses we look at in John 15, I've only found one command in these four verses. And now if I missed it, tell me because I'm a human and I can listen. And I'll clap and thank you. The only command I find, can anybody see what it is in John 15, 1 to 4? Don't be shy because you're, the best students are the one who answers wrong because you're trying to answer. Abide. Yes, abide. Abide in me is the only command in these verses. That means we are accountable to respond to this command. John 15, 4 says, abide in me and I in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Well, hey, you guys can't either unless you abide in me. That word abide, we don't use a lot in modern English. We should. There's a lot of Bible words I want to bring back, right? Like behold. I love that word. Abide. Oh, where do you abide? Oh, my abode is over here. Wouldn't it just up our quality of life? We'd almost be like Downton Abbey people. We'd be all proper, you know. But, you know, it's like, where do you live? You know, where do you live? Where do you abide? We should answer that bull people like, where do you live? Oh, where do I abide? I'm, not, I'm sorry, I went on a retreat this weekend. And... <laughs> abide, abide means to stay in a given place. To stay in a certain state of mind, a relation or expectancy. To stay in it, not visit it, not be acquainted with it, not run in and out, abide. Stay there, stay there. For those of you who are newer Christians and you're overwhelmed and you're going, I cannot do this. There's too much to learn. I don't even know how to pronounce the books of the Bible. Uh, all these ladies have their act together and they have no problems. Um, realize that one of the best things you can do as a new believer is to focus on abiding, continuing, and enduring. It's not being all 
you know, victory in Jesus. Uh, it, it, it's that steadfast, day to day, moment by moment, adherence to Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, that you will one day wake up and realize you grew. You know, it's when we take care of a plant and we water it every day, right? Then one day we realize, oh my gosh, it grew. If you grow one, you plant it one day and you water it, it's not gonna, you know what my dad did to me? This is what my dad, my dad was a wonderful man, but we planted watermelon seeds when we were kids. We had eight kids in our family. So it was a cheap form of entertainment. My dad got us all watermelon seeds. <laughs> Well, and then we read about how to plant them in our encyclopedias. For those of you who are younger, those are a group of books that were our, our Google. Yeah. Of, yeah. So you'd look them up, and then by the time they were published, they were already out of date. Okay, yeah, I know. So then you had to go to the library and look at readers' guides to periodicals. Right? Remember those? Do you remember you used the, um, uh, the microfiche? I, I just want to make the younger people feel, because they always make us feel like we don't know things. Yeah. This is my chance. We know things. Okay. But there's, we, when we wanted to get information, we actually had to search it out and not just believe it because it was on Facebook. So he looked up how to do watermelons. And you have to build these mounds to make watermelons. And you plant the seed up on the top of these mounds. So my dad was an engineer. He was a researcher. He wanted to do all that. So outside my window, he goes, well, let's do yours right outside the window. So and from your room, you can see your watermelon plant growing. That sounds so much fun. So we, we went out there and we did it. And the, it sprouted. I was so excited, my little green thing. And I watered it every day and it grew and it grew and it grew. And then one day, my dad, I didn't look out the window. My dad goes, have you looked at your watermelon plant? I go, no. He goes, you should go look at it. So I went out there. There's a watermelon. There's a watermelon on my mound, like six days later, from that time. <laughs> I'm really not that naive, you know what I'm saying? I may be a city girl, but I'm sure that watermelon did not grow in six, six days. And he was like all laughing, and everybody's, all my brothers were there. I think they took pictures of how cute I was, because I was actually, wasn't fascinated, but, I went, oh, ha, ha, there's a watermelon there. Okay, I'll tell you what happened to that watermelon. It killed my plant. I know, take a moment of silence. <laughs> I'm still going through counseling for it. It killed my plant because somebody wanted something so fast and to be done so quickly to see reactions, to taste it, that we didn't get the, the joy that you get when you reap something that you've taken a long time sowing and planting and watering. And so um, don't get, don't worry about people inspecting your fruit, new believers, because right now you don't get fruit without a good root, okay? So you're starting on roots. You don't care whether people think you have, don't worry, you're living for Jesus, okay? We're not living for each other. So just, you know, talk to the hand. I'm following Jesus, thank you. Don't put your watermelon on my plant. You'll kill it. You know, don't do that. So there, we have to know that there's this continuance, this endurance, this, this desire to bear fruit, but not an expectancy of when the fruit should come. That's where we're going to get. And I don't mean just in ourselves. Because I think we're, we're a lot more patient with ourselves than we are with others. <laughs> well, my husband should already have. He's been walking with the Lord this long. You know, you know, he knows Hebrew. He should have this down. He doesn't. He just knows Hebrew. It has nothing to do with the Spirit. So don't do that with each other. You know, don't do that. Don't, don't, don't judge somebody's growth on yours. Focus on abiding. That's the command. It doesn't say make sure other people abide. It says you abide. Stay in a given place, state, relation, or expectancy. Continue, dwell, endure, be present, and remain. If anybody wants a copy of these notes, you can email me, and I will send them to you. It's Maureen Schaefer at AOL.com. Just when you get back, send me a note, and I'll, I'll send them to you. Um, he's saying, look, your commitment um, to being with me is going to change because I'm out of here. So 
I need you to know what abiding is. It doesn't mean walking with me from village to village. And you know, it's, it's, this abide is a whole nother abide that you're about ready to, because they were already kind of living with him, weren't they? Traveling with him. So when he tells him abide, it's something different. He's telling them, you once abided with me, but he tells them, you know, pretty soon, you're gonna be in me. And so what's interesting is the Bible says we love him because? Right, 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 right. So we're only supposed to know about being in him because he came into us first. We can't abide in him unless we understand he's coming. And if you're here tonight and Christ has never come in to your body to, to, to take the throne room of your life and to rule and reign over everything, your sexuality, your desires, your words, your relationships. If you have that empty feeling that church is not filling, because it won't, if you know there's something missing, Christ is to dwell in your heart by faith. And as you confess your sin, say, I have sinned, and his blood washes you, he can move in to a holy temple and take over your life, and you will never be alone. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. In the previous chapters, Jesus tells his disciples what is shortly going to happen. And he tells them, um, back, in, back in John 14, no, that's forward, John 14, 4. Okay, where the Holy Spirit picks up when Jesus ascends to heaven. In John 14, 17, Jesus says, the spirit of truth, John 14, 17, he tells them, this is again, all at the end of his life, he says, the spirit of truth, whom the Lord cannot receive because it doesn't see him and definitely doesn't know him. But you know him. The Holy Spirit is dwelling with you. This is when Jesus was on earth and he was with his disciples because the Holy Spirit is dwelling with you. One of the ways that the Holy Spirit was dwelling with them was in Christ, in Christ's body. The Holy Spirit was there. And he says he is with you. And he says, um, Verse 18, I will not leave you as orphans. I'm leaving, but I'm not just bailing. I would never do that to you guys. You're dependent on me. He goes, I will come to you. So he's telling them the Holy Spirit is going to be in you. I, I, I would never leave you stranded in this world, this fallen world, without someone to take care of you, to provide for you, to look out for you, to love you, to laugh with you, to make you feel at home. I would never do that to you. I'm going to come to you through the indwelling Holy Spirit. Christ will dwell within their bodies, and Christ does dwell within our bodies by the Holy Spirit. Those of us who have put our faith in Christ as our Savior and Lord, we're supposed to know that Christ is in us. Conceptually, most of you would say amen. Experientially, most of you go, ah, what do you mean he's in me? Most of you bow and you picture him in heaven, seated at the right hand of the Father. You might picture him in our midst because we're gathered in his name. You might ask, where are you as you're praying? He's like, I, I am near. I'm dwelling within you. It says in Colossians 1.27, Christ in you, the hope of glory. First John 4.4, 4, he who is in you, is greater than he who is in the world. Ephesians 3.17, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Galatians 2.20, Christ lives in me. 1 Corinthians 3.16, do you not know you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? Take it to the bank and enjoy it. Some of you feel misunderstood, alone, ostracized, don't fit in. Christ is in you. Amen. He gets you. You don't even get yourself. And he gets you. Amen. Um, we sang that song tonight. I love it. We sing it a little different at our church, the timing. And the way we sing it, we say, um, It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded. So the other morning I was singing that song in, in, at, at my house. I don't sing it a lot, but it just came to my mind. And I go, that's such a neat concept, you know? 
because you know you have this like the enemies here but then you have these warriors around there and then he's inside of me and why am I intimidated and I was kind of thinking about it as I'm brushing my teeth and curling my hair and then I was on my way to church and I put on our live feed because I was late and so I was listening to the live feed and um, my son was leading worship and I turned on and he goes it may look like I'm, oh. and my son doesn't live with me. I didn't know he was doing the song, you know. So I went, oh my gosh. So then I realized that, okay, that's me. That's me. That's me. And then say, what? What do I feel surrounded? Like you know, you're just dialoguing with God. Like, why is this hitting me so much? And I said, do I feel surrounded by anything? I go, no, I don't. I'm into the song. I don't feel surrounded by anything. And he goes, but what are you intimidated by? And the Holy Spirit kind of guides you. Such a wonderful counselor. And I said. Well, I think it's something that's inside of me. It's intimidating me a bit. This adenoid cystic carcinoma, this cancer that moved in, never had a for rent sign. I never advertised for anybody to move into my body. And this cancer moved into my body. Try to evict it. It doesn't listen. So it's inside of my body. It's, it's now all over my lungs and my pleura. It's growing fast. So I go, well, yeah, it does look like, like this ACC is inside me. And the Lord goes, well, what else is inside of you? He goes, who else is inside of you? I go, oh, you're inside of me. You know, like, I know that. I'm a Bible teacher. <laughs> Duh. But knowing, <laughs> knowing something and owning something. Different. Different. Especially at certain times. And you learned something two weeks ago, you might need it in six weeks. So don't poo-poo and go, what do I need that for? And the Lord goes, oh, put it, I know what you need it for. Learn it. So then I started changing it. So I, I started going, it may look like cancer's inside me, but you're living in me too. It may look like cancer's in my lungs, but Jesus, you're inside of me too. And then I started picturing the beauty of the Lord inside of me, like the Shekinah glory that, that landed in the temple or was on the tabernacle. You know, the presence of God, you know what I'm saying? And it's just, whoa. And then going, that's just, whoa, inside of me, inside of me, inside of me. Then I'm going, cancer, Christ. What's more powerful inside of me? Christ is. So I'm going, oh, then I should be a little more intimidated by his presence than intimidated by cancer. And cancer may take my body down, but hey, from dust we came, dust we shall return, blessed be the name of the Lord. So that's not really an issue. I don't need to be afraid of something in me when something stronger is within me. And the relationship that I have with anything inside me should be more with Christ in me than the cancer that's inside of me. Then I started studying things. I was getting all into it. You know when you just sense the Lord going, you need more of this. I do need more of this. And so he says, he tells me, and I had somebody research it for me because I was really busy. And this friend of mine loves to research things in the Bibles. Love having friends who love to do that. And I, I said, hey, hey, when Hezekiah took over as king and the temple was in disrepair, it was locked, you couldn't get in, nobody had been doing sacrifices, there was trash and rubbish throughout the temple. It was, it was horrible. Bricks were falling apart, nobody could get in. I said, was the Shekinah glory of God still in the Holy of Holies? I never really thought about it. Because I, that's pretty sad that all this rubbish is between the people and the presence of God. And, and, and they've closed the doors and not let people get to his presence, you know? I'm going, was his presence still there in the Holy you know, She researched it and we all agreed, yes, he was. So then I realized that if, if I go through this decaying process of this body that is made to wear out. Um, as it falls apart, I'm gonna just picture myself getting closer and closer. I get to see the kind of glory of God when the whole temple falls apart, because what's holding him back? It wasn't the Holy Holies. Now the whole building's gone, the temple's gone. So what's left? The kind of beautiful, big presence of God. Christ is in us. Before he commands us to abide in him, he came into us first. So he showed us how it's done. And he never leaves us. 
and he never forsakes us. He says, I am with you when? Always. Our VBS song. I have to sing it because it always comes up on this. It says, I am with you always. I am with you always. I am with you always. Then he goes, ah, 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 ah
right? No clean chonies, right? <laughs> the trash be overflowing, right? I, I get it, but that doesn't make us the vines. It just makes us keepers of the home, okay? So don't mix those two things together. He tells them, I'm the vine, you're the branches. Look at verse five, continuing. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Just like a branch has no ability to sustain itself. Apart from Jesus Christ, we absolutely cannot mature, uh, retain life, produce what we were designed to produce, um, weather storms without the true vine. He's saying you're absolutely dependent on me for identity, nourishment, even to meet other branches. How the branch can meet another branch? Connected to the vine and they're connected to the vine and hey, hi, how are you? And you know, you gotta, if you want friends, you gotta stay close to Jesus. You don't go around looking for friends, you stay close to Jesus and the right friends come along. If you look at a grapevine, it is virtually impossible to see where the branch ends and the vine begins. There's no like Velcro, you know what I'm saying? There's no like zipper, there's no line. It, it, you can't even make a call. Oh, I guess the vine starts here. No, they're so intertwined with each other. You can definitely see parts of the branch you know are the branch. You can see parts that are definitely, you know, are the vine, but there's a, such a connection and a blur, you don't know where one starts and the other begins. That's the kind of abiding Jesus wants us to have as his disciples. Galatians 2.20 says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live. But Christ lives in me. We talked about Christ in us. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. He lives in me, I abide in him. He is the one we draw our strength from. We're not drawing our strengths from how many years we've walked with God. Past victories how long we've been over our ministry. We're not drawing our strength from history. We're drawing our strength from him. And we have to wake up in the morning and know that. We have to just say, I don't want to do anything without making sure I'm abiding in him this morning. Jesus, I'm here before you. I can't tell you how often the prayers in my journal in the morning say, here I am, I don't trust myself now. I'm, I'm starting out my day saying, I'm absolutely dependent on you, Lord, to be a wife, to be a friend, to be kind to people, to make wise decisions, to, to see something in creation and absorb it rather than walk by because I'm so busy doing what I think is important. I will lose my life if I don't check in with you and make sure you're making me grow the way you want me to grow. I'm gonna be totally controlled by other people if I'm, not, if I'm not abiding in the true vine. I, I love it when Christians, I ask a Christian at church, hey, you want to do this ministry? Well, let me pray about it. Okay. And they come back. And they go, I prayed about it. I really feel like the Lord doesn't want me to do that. He's showing me I'm supposed to do this. I go, oh, thank you. The Lord's building our church. And so, you know, so like, well, we have a need. And you have that. Uh, that's, and then you're like, all these other vines are trying to control our churches. And, Jesus is the vine, and we, we go by him. And we, if people think we're weird or lazy or whatever, that, you know, goodbye, bye-bye. Love them and care for them, but don't feel shaken by them. You know, we're not living for each other. We're, we're trying to, we're gonna get judged by God. You're not gonna, when I die, y'all aren't gonna stand there and say, I think she, God's gonna go, I don't wanna hear it. I'm the judge. You guys are branches. Get out of here. Like, you know, you're all fellow branches. And what's interesting about the fruit is the vine. The vine help provides the, the fruit. The vine dresser inspects the fruit. The branch produces it. <laughs> and you know what hit me once about this one day when I was 
I went on this one retreat. They did this really in-depth study on this whole section. It was just phenomenal. And I realized, I go, hey, wait a minute. All the fruit that he's talking about in, in John 15 is grapes, right? He's talking about grapes. Well, most grapes that they were harvesting, what were they using the grapes for? Most. Wine. Not, they did eat grapes, but the majority was wine. So, it takes a lot of grapes to make wine. One branch could never make enough grapes to make enough wine. It has to be from all the branches. And usually what happened, the vine dresser doesn't just take every, he finds the, the, on each branch, he finds which ones are ripe. And he puts them all together. Then it becomes this beautiful thing. So we're not even producing fruit by ourselves just so God tells us we did good. We're producing fruit with other people to provide this beautiful fragrance to the Lord that he takes as a combination of fruit from all the little branches. And that makes me, that makes me happy because I go, oh, I want, my, I want my fruit to mix with her fruit and her fruit and his fruit and, and God to put it together and be so pleased as a vine dresser. I can do this now. I can take it, stomp it, use it, and make it into wine that will be a blessing to other people. If we really understand we're branches and there's no life within us apart from the true vine whose life is in us, we're going to start and we're going to, if, if we don't, or did I say don't or do? If we really understand that we can't do anything without him, uh, we will start, live, um, and end each day dependent on him. We we'll put our hand on the pillow and go, you know, anything that happened today, I give you the glory. Because I have a big mouth, I have a lazy attitude, I get discouraged, I get overly offended, whatever you go through. It was that I weathered that. I couldn't have done that without you, Lord. You really are feeding into me things I would never have done. You're giving me nourishment I've never even experienced. I'm thriving in ways I could never have done by just being religious or being in a church and trying to imitate people. You know, imitation fruit is plastic. Okay, we want fruit that grows inside of us and it doesn't grow overnight. So how do we abide in him? How do we make sure we are connected to Jesus like a branch that's connected to the vine? I'm just going to give you a couple of tips. In Psalm 123, verse 1, the psalmist says, Unto you I lift up my eyes, O you who dwell in the heavens. And we did that song, it was a great song, but the creator of heavens. Verse 2, Behold, as the eyes of servants look to the hand of their masters, this is in Psalm 123, as the eyes of a maid to the hand of her mistress, so our eyes look to the Lord our God. So one way we abide in him, he's already in us. We lift up our eyes. We don't just look at what's around us, like, you know, it may look like I'm surrounded. We look higher. That's a choice, you guys. It says we lift our eyes. We go a little higher than what we're going through. No one can do this for us, by the way. Nobody can make us lift our eyes to the Lord. And I like where it says it's like a handmaiden. It means someone that's hired to sit there, and every time her master or whoever is over there, and she wants, you know, she wants water, the the servant girl will look, and her master, who is the mistress will look over at the water like that. And she'll know without even speaking to go and give her water. She has to keep her eye on the person she serves at all times. That's what we're doing. Even on this retreat, you guys, I encourage you, all, try to abide super long this weekend because we're on that theme. When you're walking into breakfast, don't you say, oh yeah, I'm gonna sit with my friends. Maybe you will, but you say, Lord, is there somewhere else you'd like me to sit, someone to reach out to? And if you don't sense it, then go sit with your friends. Don't get all, oh, I don't know if I heard God. Just <laughs> lift your eyes. Just lift it up a little bit and say, higher than my nature, let me be a servant that is in you, that's drawing direction from you, strength from you. Have you ever been in a conversation you just didn't want to be in? And you're like, okay, you're attached to the vine. Say, Lord, give me what I need. For this I do not like this conversation. I don't want to be in this conversation. And ask the Lord 
draw from him. You're in conflict with your husband. Draw from the vine right then instead of your own resources of what you're going to say next. Psalm 119 verse 15 says, I will meditate on your precepts and contemplate your ways. Notice both of these psalms use a four-letter word called will. It's a will, it's a choice. Abide is a command. Will is what you're going to do. So we mull over his truths. We take his truths, we turn them around our minds and our hearts like a beautiful jewel. We treasure his words. His word is alive, and when we meditate on what he says, we aren't dwelling on all the other stuff out there. We are letting his words abide in us, and we suddenly are, are drawing from him. Sometimes when I open the Bible, I, 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 I'm used to opening my Bible, and I just think I handle it too flippantly. You know, I open it. You know, and sometimes I go, you know what? That was just too flippant. These are your words and they are alive. And I just, you know, have my bowl of cereal, my cup of coffee, I'm opening up the Bible. I want, I, I want to be more reverent. I want to really have an esteem and treasure his words. I don't want to treat diamonds like they're marbles and I'm just throwing them around, you know? And sometimes I will, I'll just open it, I'll put my hands on it, I'll say, Lord, forgive me. I have become, things that are holy are becoming too common. And I, I, I don't want to do that because I know they're more, I don't want to grow dull of hearing. I want to be on the edge of my seat to follow you. Matthew 6, seek first the kingdom of God, his righteousness. So we should make his priorities our priorities. We have to be in agreement with him and live out our lives with his agenda at the forefront of our minds. That's how we abide in him. We don't check in with him. I'm gonna do this, this, and that, and then I'll go to Bible study, and I'll do this, this, and that, and then I'll do my devotions. Then you're just like checking in with God. That's not, that's like a branch walking around the vineyard, do to do meeting everybody, and then comes back and tries to connect again. Yep, need a little more juice, okay, do to do walking around. He can't do that. Branches will die if they do that. They're, they're severed. Don't get entangled with this world. Seek in prayer and communication and evaluation what God says is right. Don't believe what the greatest trends are in righteousness and goodness. Get back to what he says is sin. Get back to what he says is righteous. Isaiah 8, 5 says, The Lord also spoke to me again, saying, Inasmuch, and I'm gonna, this is, I think this is where I'm ending, Inasmuch as these people refused, I'm going to give you the reference, because you you're going to go, I don't get it, but I'm going to tell you. I wouldn't do that to you. Isaiah 8, 5. The Lord said to me again, this is how we're going to abide, saying, Inasmuch as these people refused the waters of Shiloh that flow softly. Now, I know you guys are going, Great, deep, the waters, I don't understand. Okay, the waters of Shiloh represent the throne, the water that flows from God's throne when he's in charge. And we get in the flow of the river from his throne and his authority, and we get in there and we let it take us in the direction it needs to go. That's how you abide. You cooperate with the flow of the Lord. You don't stand on the banks or get in a boat and get your oar. No, I don't want to go that way. I want to turn left that way. Just jump in the water's great and let your day go the way he wants it to go. This is abiding in him. It's going throughout the day. That's how you can let people, no, no, really, we'll go to the restaurant you like. Because you're not stubborn, stiff-necked. You're abiding and you're letting the vine cause you to grow in areas and in a direction you might not have chosen because you trust him and he loves you. And you're in the waters of Shiloh that flow softly. Not the torrential waters of your own lane that you want to go in. That's how you abide. I'm sorry, there are two more verses. I'm not sorry, there are two more verses. I'm sorry, I told you that was the last verse. Proverbs 3, 6. In all your ways, acknowledge him. He will direct your paths. And I love number seven. 
Don't be wise in your own eyes. That rhyme, just you always remember with a uh, 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 uh. This one, don't be wise in your own eye. Let's do it, ready? Don't be wise in your own eye. Again, don't be wise in your own eye. Okay, you'll always remember that. And then you start thinking like, well, I think. You know when we do that, our eyes actually get haughty and arrogant. We go, do you ever notice? You don't go, oh, well, I think that maybe. You go, well, I think, well, I can't. Your eyes do it. Your eyes do it. You already know you're being arrogant by your eyes. You're like, you know, don't be wise in your own eyes. Uh, you know, it's important for us to acknowledge him in all our past. We all know the verse, we just don't all do the verse. But I would rather have you do it than know it. Acts seventeen twenty eight. For in him we live. In the Lord we move. In the Lord we have our being. Live every breath, move every action. Having our being, our identity, our purpose, our priorities, our existence. That in him. If you're going to the doctor, you're going to the doctor. Abiding in him. If you're going to the beach, you're going in him. That way there's a consistency in our lives that we're not so all over the place. He is with us always. And we are drawing from him for everything we do. I went to have a scan done yesterday. This guy, you know, they always ask you, what's your birthday? You know, so I told the guy on the thing to make sure they have the right patient. I told him my birthday, he goes, that's my birthday. I go, well, what do you know about that? You know, and he said, so you're a Libra too. And I looked at him, my eyes went. <laughs> and he goes, well, I'm not really into that. He said, I go, yeah, you shouldn't. He goes, well, I go, you gotta, you gotta know the one who made the stars. He'll give you way better direction than the stars themselves. Okay, okay. So <laughs> then we abide and continue, endure and dwell in Christ. You guys, let's let's be those branches who remain completely dependent on the true vine, so that the fruit just comes. We're not really supposed to focus on bearing the true fruit. We focus on abiding in the vine, and the vine sends everything we need to produce the fruit. Can I also challenge us? You're, we're all a bunch of branches next to each other. If you get mad at somebody because their fruit, you don't like it. You know, what? Maybe they severed, maybe they're accident. Or maybe they, they're drawing from a false vine. Can you be more concerned about their walk with Christ than how their walk affects you? Let's care for each other because it's all the branches and the true vine that make up the vineyard from which the vine dresser draws his fruit. Lord, thank you for this time of talking about abiding. I would ask you by your spirit to make it translate into each of our lives in a way that we can obey you and it would bring forth the fruit that you wanted to. Open our eyes, Lord, to behold wondrous things out of your law. Help us to be teachable, open, and, and correctable as well. In Jesus' name, amen.